If you don't know Mary Keene, she's been at You Gotta Believe for 18 years. Can you believe it, Mary? And she's also a mom to many. Um, and she's just a, a giant in the field. She's my personal shero. She technically her title is senior advisor, but that doesn't come close to explaining everything that she is and does. And then Pat O'Brien, another one of my favorite people, another giant in the field, founder of You Gotta Believe, executive director of AFFCNY, um, which is the Adoptive and Foster Family Coalition of New York. So delighted to have you here both. So we thought we would have um, this quick moderated conversation to sort of set the table about what we're talking about today. Um, so Pat, I'll start with you. Can you share with us how did moral adoption come about? Where did this idea come from? It, it basically came about with the founding of You Gotta Believe. Um, there was only one thing we were gonna do when we started, and that was gonna be find permanent families that any young person in foster care who was on the verge of aging out and didn't have one. Um, I, I essentially called You Gotta Believe in the beginning a homelessness prevention program because the greatest single cause of homelessness at that time in the mid 90s was kids aging out of foster care. And there was a way to absolutely prevent that by not, not letting kids age out without a permanent family. So, um, so but not every, every young person was freed for adoption. Not every young person wanted to be adopted, but every young person, if they were in foster care, needed to be in a permanent place. And the system was not set up to do that. Mm -hmm. So right. so we basically, and, and it was just one day, I was just saying, well, the kids who, who, who are, are, are going to be, um, be, be replaced with, you got to believe, will either be uh, legally adopted or morally adopted. So that's sort of how, how the, the term got coined. Right. Thank the, you. Somebody that we're recruiting is making a lifetime commitment to them. And speaking of that, when you when we think of the word parent in the context of moral adoption, what what does that mean to you, Pat? And and, and actually, in the context of every 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 parent young person relationship, it's at least one adult who makes a unilateral decision to unconditionally commit to a child mm -hmm. or youth's well being for a lifetime. And the unilateral is the most important part there, because nobody when they <clears throat> when they um, have a baby asks the baby if you want to be born. It's a decision that the parent makes. And that's true of all, because a lot of our young people are not even going to believe that the families that we recruit for them are going to be permanent until you know years after they yeah. age out of foster care, but they don't age out of the family. So it's a commitment that a parent makes for a lifetime. I got it. Now, Mary, I'm going to shift to you. What does moral adoption look like in the practice of our day-to-day -day work at You Gotta Believe? So it really is, as, as Pat said, we are looking for people who will unconditionally commit to any kid that they match with. And again, we don't do placement, we do matching. Okay. Um, and, and we get them a lot of information. I always tell people they have more information than they would ever have with a birth child because you still can't check off what you want and what you don't want okay. in a birth child. So they'll have a lot of background information on the children that either we identify as potential matches or they identify. But the, the thing that we're adamant about is that regardless of what, because we don't know everything about anybody, and when they come into your home, there'll be surprises, there'll be things um, maybe unexpected, good and bad, and that's your kid. Mm -hmm. You know, just to me, I, I sort of think of it as, as you flick a light switch. If you wanna be a parent, you can actually parent anybody. Mm -hmm. um, because as, as Pat said, it's unilateral. You make a decision to be a parent and everything that goes with that. Um, you have no control. You can't dictate this is the way it's going to be or anything. You just have to be open and committed um, and be there for whatever kid you connect with. And why would the option of moral adoption even come up? And why moral adoption over legal adoption in some cases? So there are so many reasons that legal adoption are is not what kids want. Um, it I also have problems with it because it means termination of parental rights while they're younger, not not when they're older, but it does mean that when they're younger. And why should there be a need to do that? Mm -hmm. And many kids have been adopted and sort of been unadopted, broken adoptions. Mm -hmm. So they have no reason to believe in adoption. 
Um, and, and overall, they just, you know, Pat touched on it. They are not the ones to make the commitment. It's for the adult to say they're going to be there no matter what. And the kid can come and go and do as they please. But um, for the most part, many of them just don't want adoption. Some of them do. I mean, there's no question about that. And then that's fine. But I think termination of parental rights is something that really should be avoided. Um, adoptions also wind up with a changed birth certificate, mm -hmm. which in my mind is a fraudulent document. And I'm sort of amazed that it continues to this day to be issued by a government agency. Um, and that shouldn't be, we should not want to erase kids past or their history. We should, in my mind, we should come up with something that says you have legal responsibility, you've made a commitment to this child, but you're not trying to erase their past or have them disconnected from their birth family in any way whatsoever. Exactly. Thank you, Mary. And I want to ask both of you this. How did you find that moral adoption was necessary? And I know, Mary, you have experienced moral adoption on a personal level. Um, and then Pat, obviously, on a, on a professional level and, and um, sort of expanding this movement. But how did you find that it was necessary that, that it should be an, an option that should be explored? Um, Pat, I'll start Mary, with you. Let's start with me. Okay. Um, well, it was sort of... Uh, like every young person in the care of the state right now, who's not in a permanent place, which is just about every young person in the, our care right now, needs a permanent family. Um, I liken it to, um, I mean, I, I came up with a, a coin like, like the I don't know kid. And, and when, you, when you ask, what, when you answer to the question is, where's Johnny or Janie going to live and what family they're going to be a part of when they age out of foster care, and your answer is, I don't know, mm -hmm. then that's urgently that young person needs a, a permanent family recruited for them. And, and, and again, adoptive a family if it's possible, but uh, a moral adoption if it's not, because that square peg kid, that square peg kid has a, a square peg need. And where that young person is living right now is in some sort of round hole family or facility. And round hole is not a bad thing. It's okay. just a temporary thing. So everybody here today watching knows that I don't know kid at greatest need is having a permanent family recruited for them. That's why you got to believe was created to not just let kids be discharged to nobody but themselves, but for us to use the system to get them a permanent family. And you got to believe has been very good at good at utilizing the system to not do temporary, but to do permanent. Perfect. And then, Mary, I know you'll talk about this a little bit more in your family panel, but can you just touch on the role that moral adoption has played personally in your life and your family? Absolutely. Um, so I began not through you got to believe. I started as a traditional temporary foster parent. Um, I really didn't know what I was doing, but I knew I wanted to help um, teenage girls. And I had met a lot of them who were in foster care and it just seemed like they had a raw deal. So I do things in a big way. I got a big house, opened up, got licensed and said, you know, just send me your teenage girls, which they did willingly. But throughout my training at the beginning, it was always just, well, you'll be like uh, a passage for them to somewhere else. They didn't know where the somewhere else was, but I was never expected to keep them. I, I was never talked, no one ever talked about the beginning adoption and stuff. The kids were not legally freed for the most part. And so I, not knowing what I was doing, it took me about six months to realize through a number of things um, that I learned from the kids themselves, was that they didn't need any more temporary. They'd had temporary, they'd had temporary foster parents. They had people that kicked them out when they did something. They, they wound up being a big fight in my house and the, the girls involved went and packed because they knew they had to leave after a fight. When I reported it to the agency, they said, oh, who has to leave? one or both of them. Mm -hmm. And it just struck me that, you know, when I was growing up, I always fought with my little brother. It was tradition. And I couldn't understand why they thought they should leave. They just had a fight. You know, they were emotional. And so I said, no, nobody's leaving. And instead, they all went to therapy and they hated me for that. But they weren't leaving. And I told them to unpack, put your stuff away. 
And so they're the ones who taught me that they needed somebody to be there, no matter what they did, no matter if they broke the rules, if they went AWOL, um, because they had no place else to go. You know, these are older kids, they were not going home. And they just needed me to not be temporary. So I never got it from the agency. I never got it from the workers. In fact, I was never treated. Once I made my commitment, and as Pat said, it was unilateral because the kids didn't believe it. Um, they didn't think I was going to be there. They were sure that it was too good to be true. They didn't deserve it. And um, I was going to get rid of them. And they kept waiting for that mm -hmm. to happen. And, and only when it didn't, did they come around. And that, for some of them, it took a long time. Sure. Um, but it, it just, they needed somebody. And so I decided to be that somebody. But I was never treated with um, sort of the belief of the agency that I was a real parent. Yeah. I was always, I was a temporary parent. They tried to take my kids away a number of times because of things they did. They felt I didn't have control over them. <laughs> Who has control over a teenager? And, yeah. and, and they tried to get them into a single independent living program because yeah. they would have made their program look great. Um, and I just kept saying, no, I'm, I'm here. They're not going anywhere. I'm their parent, whether you like it or not. And I just took a lot of liberties with that. But I had so many kids that the agency was not going to close my home because they wouldn't have any place to put the kids. So I got away with a lot. Um, but they were my kids, you know, from yes. the get go. Well, thank you, Mary. And I did want to address one question from Vanessa that I know, Pat, you answered in the chat, but I wanted to address it with the group. And the question from Vanessa is, does the birth certificate still change if you do a legal adoption after 18? Yes, <laughs> I've done them. Mm -hmm. Most of my adoptions were after 18. And there is a fraudulent birth certificate issued, which says that I was at Lincoln Hospital in 1983 or something like that. I think it's horrible. And I, I did the adoptions before I really understood the impact and the things that happened and what it meant. Um, and now, so I half, about half of my kids are legally adopted, the other half are not. And, and a couple of them who are not do still want to get legally adopted. And I'm just, I'm hesitant now that I know the impact. Um, I'll do it because that's what they want, but the birth certificate is changed. And, and Mary, uh, the young person can keep their name, but the parent's name must change if there's a legal adoption. Is that correct? On on the birth certificate, yes. Right. They can, any name, some of them kept their name, some of them hyphenated. The names are not the issue. The right. fact that my name is on multiple birth certificates saying I was multiple places giving birth to multiple children, it, I, it just astonishes me. And um it, it's just wrong. It's just wrong. Thank you. We'll take one more question and then we'll move on to Pat's uh, panel after this. But the question is, uh, what would you suggest the agency do to help build this sense of stability and trust for kids? It's a big question. So I'll just, I'll just pipe in. I think um, the training has to be changed to include the possibility that, um, in fact, encourage the possibility that people make a permanent commitment to their kids. If they go home, that's a wonderful thing. And actually they should stay, try to stay, and the system doesn't encourage this. They should try to stay connected to those kids because they've, they've spent time with this family. Uh, but the family should understand that what they need is a, is a commitment a lifetime commitment, even if they go home. Instead, seeds are planted with this notion that this is temporary. If this kid doesn't behave, you can call us, give us 10 day notice, give us 30 day notice, and, and we'll get you another kid, which is what they'll do. You know, they'll keep rotating kids in houses. Um, that you plant that seed and people become overwhelmed and they say, well, the professionals say that's okay. Um, then you you just, you can't let that happen. You can't let that be said. When I've done classes, I have never mentioned the 10 day notice or 30 day. I've said, you, you need to commit to the child that comes to you because they're dependent on you. And I, I just think 
the the training is is the initial problem that's right well mary thank you i know we'll see you in a bit for your panel um pat thank you